In previous episodes, we talked about polycurved masonry and the structures created with its help. The very concept of creation includes certain underlying rules. Some of these rules have not been mentioned yet. Others have already been introduced, and now we will examine them in more detail. The obvious goal of masonry is to create specific structures while considering reliability requirements. The labor factor must also be taken into account. The durability of a structure depends on both external and internal forces. In simplified terms, internal forces include the weight of the blocks and the structure as a whole. External forces involve impacts on the foundation and walls caused by earthquakes or erosion. The structure must withstand these factors for which additional measures were taken. To achieve this, additional measures were employed, which have been studied in the works of many researchers, including through modeling. I will rely on this body of data, with a particular focus on the studies of Vladimir Pyatkin and other authors. For example, the use of specific block joint profiles ensured stress distribution. From this, it naturally follows that a masonry type close to quadrangular was predominantly used in buildings, as it is the most resistant to horizontal shifts. Close to because block shapes were often not perfect rectangles. In cases where building walls or platforms were in contact with embankments, gaining additional support, the freeform type was permissible. Examples can be seen in Alente Tambo. At the same time, the contours of the second wall, now missing, had a rectangular shape, providing grounds for the assumption that the second wall was built from blocks close to rectangular, similar to the wall that contains an opening. Here we see that the masonry type changes within a single structure, optimizing it for existing loads. Instances of freeform masonry being used for buildings are rare. They are remarkable because, despite a deep understanding of nature's principles, the builders deliberately made this choice. Due to its maximum stability, the quadrangular type was also used at the corners of structures. In Tarawasi, we see a distinct example of how the honeycomb type transitions into quadrangular at the corners. This solution was inevitable. It is clear that without this transition, a block with inclined sides would not be reliably fixed due to the forces acting to push it out. Such reinforcements of support nodes testify to a deep understanding of architectural principles. To reinforce facings, a method was used in which the rear part of the blocks was fixed in the ground. For this reason, the back of the facing blocks has a protruding shape with a rough surface. This contributed to better anchoring. Combined with seating areas and locking projections, this helped counteract horizontal forces, making the use of freeform or honeycomb masonry types acceptable. The preference for these types has obvious reasons. In many cases, the initial shape of the stone blanks is closer to freeform, requiring minimal modification compared to the quadrangular type. However, natural andesite fragments tend to be more rectangular, which is why andesite masonry is often of the quadrangular type, even when used for facings. Both artificial embankments and natural rock surfaces served as support. In wall niches, the inclination of the walls provided additional fixation. This feature is not always found in buildings made of rough stone, and in some cases even has a reverse incline. Megaliths were used to strengthen the corners of facings and buildings. Given their inclination and contact with the ground, this ensured the stability of the entire section of the wall. If tensile loads were absent, joints could be flat. Thus, masonry with the same surface quality but executed with flat joints should not be classified as a different stone processing method. Instead, this is a matter of choosing different jointing principles based on functional requirements. At the same time, such masonry cannot be considered polygonal. Particular attention was paid to the foundation during construction. Sometimes a rock base was chosen, the most reliable option. In other cases, the foundation had a sophisticated drainage system consisting of multiple levels, forming a complex structure. The reinforcement methods listed above indicate that seismic resistance was not a property of polygonal masonry alone, but rather a result of the entire set of construction standards. Without adhering to these principles, polygonal masonry would not have been reliable. For example, if the foundation erodes, as happened in Sacsayhuaman, Collapse is inevitable. Likewise, if an embankment is washed away, 
the inclination and shift of the center of gravity due to the protruding rear part will no longer serve as reinforcement, leading to the toppling of block. There are other examples illustrating that polygonal masonry itself was not seismically resistant. For instance, in Rodadero, Saxaihuaman, the masonry rows are embedded into the rock, just as in Pese. The seismic stability of such structures can only be considered in terms of the stability of the rock formation itself. A similar case is seen in numerous configured grotto, where the masonry is deeply integrated into the rock and remains stable precisely for this reason. As a result, damage to these structures is minimal. After identifying the commonly known key factors contributing to the stability of masonry, we will move on to examine certain details that often escape the attention of researchers. It should be noted that facings with partial jointing are actually more reliable than polycurved ones. This is because the absence of tight, near-hermetic joints reduces the pressure from water-saturated soil, thereby lowering drainage requirements. As a result, polygonal facings are less stable in comparison. Incomplete jointing, on the other hand, increases localized pressure, improving surface adhesion at contact points. Thus, the goal of achieving perfect joints was not structural reliability, but something entirely different, which we will discuss later. In the first part, we examine the rule of using joint profiles. This rule determines not only load distribution and the appearance of the masonry, since the type of masonry itself depends on the shape of the joints. It also defines the sequence of work and block installation, the dimensions of the blocks. For quadrangular masonry, it is obvious that stone blanks were selected to match the required height and have sufficient length to ensure proper bonding. The same principles apply to the honeycomb type, with the exception that height may vary, making it easier to select stone blanks. Naturally, similar requirements exist for freeform masonry. Freeform masonry does not imply randomness. It simply means that stone blanks can have diverse shapes but still within limits defined by bonding requirements, which in turn are dictated by the sizes of the already installed blocks. If we take a section of the Saxaihuaman wall and analyze the surface areas of the blocks, it becomes evident that they follow specific proportional relationships. This is the hidden part of the polygonal concept, a principle left in plain sight by the builders, encoded in the way the blocks are proportionally divided. And this principle is precisely what creates the harmonious appearance of the structure. This harmony arises from the rhythm of size variations and spatial relationships, which the human eye naturally perceives as aesthetic balance. It can also be observed that when a stone blank of the required size was unavailable, two blocks were used as a single unit, placed either vertically or horizontally. This principle is also depicted as markings on one of the blocks in Saxaihuaman. Of course, I am not suggesting that the builders intentionally left messages. The reasons for such marks could be varied, ranging from aesthetic to practical considerations. The key point is that these markings align with the fundamental construction principles. Let's now examine symmetrical masonry sections in terms of area ratios and joint profiles. There are many such cases. However, the symmetry diminishes progressively with each block as it moves away from the central axis. This effect likely arises because masonry, when extending outward from a central block, follows natural constraints that require the use of blocks of specific sizes. Since this requirement is not rigid, symmetry is gradually lost, similar to how mathematical functions diverge after an initial approximation. Thus, symmetry emerges naturally in areas where conditions favor it. Of course, builders could have deliberately avoided symmetrical compositions if they wished. However, they did not, and they may have even encouraged their formation. This was likely not for aesthetic reasons, but rather a commitment to adhering to established construction principles. Moreover, the preference for specific joint profiles is confirmed by the fact that peripheral sections contain stone-to-stone -stone joints shaped directly to fit the available blocks. This indicates that builders could adapt blocks to any shape, and doing so may have been faster. In such cases, the goal was simply to achieve a connection, without striving for a particular joint profile. This suggests that the use of specific masonry types 
was a deliberate choice rather than a necessity. A consistent approach is also seen in the design of openings across different sites, including Alente Tambo, Pizak, and Sacsayhuaman. The reasons for this similarity are the same as those previously discussed. The range of available block sizes was limited. The restricted dimensions of structural elements further reinforced this rule. And it is even more surprising to observe cases where basic principles are not followed, for example, when bonding is disrupted. Here, however, a simple explanation can be found. As noted earlier, in some instances, two blocks function as one. Therefore, in such cases, the absence of bonding is only apparent rather than actual. In the case of Hachukosko masonry, where bonding is minimal and visible cracks appear as a result, the explanation lies in the size of the blocks, which lack sufficient length. This may be due to the fact that this masonry does not contain niches and serves a secondary function, leading to lower structural requirements. Another departure from traditional principles is the lack of bonding between rows in double row masonry, which is only present at corners and openings. We will discuss the possible reasons for this approach later. When constructing thick walls, the space between rows was filled with rubble and soil, effectively turning the walls into facing layers supporting each other. Let us move from the rules concerning masonry to those governing the creation of buildings and niches. Most of these were mentioned in the second part. Here, however, we will briefly outline them to maintain the coherence of the exposition. Buildings were constructed with inclined walls and double-layered masonry. This requirement was essential to achieve sufficient wall thickness for the inclusion of niches. Niches are found in buildings, platform facings, and rock surfaces, and they vary in size. They are either rectangular or trapezoidal in shape. Rectangular niches can be relatively small and were always made at the joint between two blocks. Naturally, this facilitated their production. However, beyond simplifying construction, this design may have served a functional purpose, such as the placement of additional elements, for instance, rods that could not have been inserted into a niche carved into a single block. Niches may be single level or stepped. For covering niches built into masonry, blocks close to a rectangular shape were used due to the optimality of this form. Nevertheless, cracks in these coverings are very common, which is to be expected. Natural stone has extremely high compressive strength, but poor tensile strength. Without reinforcement as used in reinforced concrete structures, such coverings cannot be considered reliable. This is arguably the most vulnerable element in polygonal constructions. The side walls and the space between niches were formed in various ways, depending on the type of masonry and the size of the niches. The lower part could be made from one or several blocks, inserted pieces, or be entirely carved into a megalith. A key feature of the niches is the alignment of their upper level through the adjustment of the cover block shape, even when the side and bottom parts remained unaligned. This points to the particular importance of the upper part rather than the bottom part, contrary to common utilitarian practice. At the same time, the bottom was not entirely neglected. Its level was adjusted either by removing excess stone or through the addition of a separate insert. This raises the question, why is the lower part of some niches leveled while in others it remains in a rough state? One possible explanation is that the shape of the cover block was formed during construction, as it would have been inconvenient to shape it afterward. In contrast, the lower part could be finished later, something that was not done, likely because there was no actual need for it. This is reasonable, since all signs point to the fact that the niches were not intended for storing or placing objects. The rear part of the niches was constructed with masonry, sometimes incorporating the rock base. It could consist of one or several separate blocks. One can observe the precision of the joints where they meet the rear wall. There is no data on whether the depths of the niches are consistent within a single building or row. However, it is notable that the rear wall is never found in a rough state. Its significance was clearly not neglected. Another unexplained feature is that in rock outcrops, all niches have a shape close to rectangular or even square, with minimal inward slope of the side walls. This is surprising, because in buildings, niches almost always have side walls that are taller than the horizontal ones, forming a trapezoidal shape. This cannot be explained by structural requirements since the load on the lintel does not depend on the shape of the side walls. 
There is an example in Allantai Tambo where niches in the rock have a form similar to those found in buildings. And this is virtually the only known case of such trapezoidal niches in a rock outcrop. Their specific location in Allantai Tambo is not accidental, and this will be discussed in upcoming episodes. In buildings, niches face inward. In platform facings, they face outward. There are also combined variants, where both inward and outward facing niches appear in the same structure. Niches are absent on terraces. The very term terrace is not quite accurate. What is meant is that, in cases of multi-level facings, the lower levels contain no niches. This can be considered a rule. The underlying idea was to construct multiple layers of masonry at the maximum possible height. Whereas in the creation of terraces, the goal is entirely different. To obtain the largest possible horizontal areas with the minimum necessary wall height. This concludes my overview of the main principles of polygonal masonry and the structures built using it. These findings will later be used to compare constructions from different cultures and regions. Thank you for watching and see you next time.